So today's speaker, Kevin Cooper, is a good friend of mine, a uh, colleague. He worked for the, the local forest for over 30 years as a wildlife biologist. And he'll go into some specific things that he did for the forest, but um, a couple of his side jobs is on fires when people are doing suppression actions. Oftentimes there's resource damage, so there's resource advisors that get brought in from the forest to kind of help advise and um, it, yeah, advise people on their, where they should place their uh, suppression actions and balance the need versus the uh, impact, because there's always impact either by the fire or the, the suppression actions. But he also is involved in these bear teams, these burned area emergency response teams that come in after the fire and make these rapid assessments. And because of the K fire that we had and the time of year, even though who knows um, if we're going to get any more rain, we'll pray for some March miracles. But I thought it was timely to have somebody like Kevin. He's very modest, but um, it, I'll let you know that he had a really big, informative uh, impact on the decisions that were made in Montecito and the debris flow. Um, some things that he probably won't touch on, but uh, just to, to let you know, projects that he's worked on for the forest, non-fire related, the California condor, very, uh, very, um, no, he pushed that uh, ball forward and everybody knows the recovery that's happened since then. That was really big by the forest and Kevin's efforts. And then also done thing with bighorn sheep back in the backcountry. Um, probably in my opinion, nobody knows our backcountry in terms of plants and animals and the impacts that fire have on them as uh, Kevin. So he's, he's a, good, a good person, an avid runner. I know, Joan, you probably like that. <laughs> and uh, I think we're all in for a treat. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, great to see everybody here. It's, uh, it's, it's good to be back. I spent a lot of time here over the last several years working on different fires with Rob Lewin, who was the, the director here before. So, uh, yeah, my name's Kevin Cooper. As, as Nick said, I, I work for the Forest Service. I uh, started in 1988 on the Los Padres, and I was here that whole time. So it's been a long time. Um, I, I, hopefully I learned a lot. There's still a lot to learn. But um, right now I'm working for an outfit called Resolute Associates. Uh, you may know the director, Rob Lewin. So a lot of you people yeah. know who he is. Uh, he's working with Garrett Olson and uh, doing a lot of emergency management and, and uh, plans for different agencies and, and uh, communities. Uh, my role with them is, is as a biologist, but also um, working mostly with fuels programs with uh, Santa Barbara County, got some project with Robbie there, and on the San Luis County Fire Safe Council. Um, and I work with the city of Montecito doing some drone mapping and some, some videography, so uh, <coughs> keeping myself pretty busy there too. I'm also working as an AD for the Forest Service as a bear team leader with uh, Yanni Schwartz. Some of you may know Yanni, he's our the geologist who's now the bear team leader. Um, so you may see me back here. If it doesn't rain again, I don't know. We'll see how the summer's shaping up. It's pretty dry out there. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk to you, today, as Nick said, about my role as a biologist and how that kind of led into fire and, and how fire became such a big part of my job. I mean, I just in, inescapable um, aspect of working on the Los Padres is that fire is what it's about, right? We really don't have timber programs. That's the main thing. And as a biologist, you know, uh, wildlife management really became a part of fuels management. It was the same thing, fire management. So we'll talk about my background as resource advisor and uh, what a biologist does, and um, also a bear team, what, what a bear team's about, uh, and, and some of the work that I did here on the Thomas fire. And if we got time, a little bit on the cave fire. <coughs> I, was, I wasn't on that event, but I was in, Yanni Schwartz had me in his back pocket the whole time. I was, I was behind the scenes, and uh, I, I spent some time in the field out there too. So you know a little bit about that. Um, and that will we'll, that'll wrap it up after that. So, Nick, what kind of timeline are we looking at? This wanna... 45 minutes, 45 now, minutes. and then some time for questions if okay. there are any. Sounds, yeah. sounds good. I got a lot of slides, but I talk fast, so we'll see, see how that goes. Um, I'm not from the Central Coast. I, I grew up in Southern Illinois, uh, the son of a Forest Service researcher uh, who didn't like the heat in Southern Illinois and spent his time, uh, all his annual leave, dragging us as kids and family around the Western U.S. I fell in love with the West and went to school at University of Montana, um, where I studied uh, wildlife biology and school of forestry there. And uh, <coughs> uh, spent my summers working for the Park Service as a climbing ranger at Mount Rainier. And I ended up coming back to the, to the Park Service for my graduate work. And um, my roommate was a guy named Mike Swayze. He was a graduate student for, with Jim Agee, another fuels person. Uh, and um, so I became very interested in fuels and fire management, and it worked out pretty good. I ended up moving down to San Luis Obispo, and uh, I got a job with the Forest Service here um, as a GS3 fuels technician. So uh, it was very interesting. 
wasn't much money back then as a GS3, but uh, it was a really good job because I got around to see all the backcountry. I got I really had that that opportunity to be out there and see all this different country for years and years. It was really a good background for, for learning these things. So um, with that, I think we'll just start out. Um, here's the Los Padres National Forest. You're probably familiar with that one. It's almost two million acres from top to bottom. That's the, the Monterey District up there. And here we are in Goleta. Uh, and then <coughs> this is the, uh, the grapevine over here. Huge variety of, of uh, habitats in here. It goes all the way from the redwoods and the coastal areas to almost 9,000 feet in Mount Pinus. We've got some subalpine country. We've got semi-desert country. So we've got this huge biodiversity, right? And we have this immense diversity of plants and animals. We're one of the biodiversity hotspots in the world. So there's, there's maybe six of them, but this is one of them in this area. So uh, with all those species, we have a lot of endangered species too that really flavored and colored my job as a biologist and what the Forest Service does. It impacted everything. So everything that was happening across the forest needed some input from a biologist. So job security for me, but uh, worked really well because I got to be involved with a lot of different projects and, and learn a lot about different things. Um, one thing about the forest here, you see all this green, uh, you'll know if you've looked at other maps, there's a lot of private, that's not all Forest Service lands in there. So this is the old congressional boundary. Um, and from an ecological perspective, the Forest Service is not representative of all of Central California. It's a subset of what's out there because in the early 1900s when the forests were formed, uh, they, were, they were created from lands that weren't privatized yet. They, they really weren't plantable. They didn't, they didn't really grow crops very well or, or have grazing opportunities on them. So it was that steep, high, brushy country that burned all the time and flooded and uh, the country that at that time no one wanted. Some of it's been privatized since then. But um, it's another challenge that we're trying to manage species and habitats with a subset of what's really representative and what those animals need. So uh, just to line that out. Okay, so what, is a, <coughs> what does a forest biologist do? Well, as I said, endangered species management really was what we ended up doing, what most forest biologists do now. That's, uh, you've got the Federal Endangered Species Act that has these listed species and we have to take care of them. On a forest like this with this much diversity, Endangered species are pretty much everywhere, so almost every project uh, has that aspect to it. It really colors it. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time working on uh, uh, supporting of, these, of, of all the other functions. We're trying to protect the species and habitat, recovery protection, oh, there's a screen there that's easier to read. Um, <coughs> but we work with all the other functions and all the other things that the forest does. Uh, we don't really have much of a timber program here, but there's a lot of recreation, there's a range program, and of course, fuels and fire was a big thing. I worked with Nick a lot on different projects and uh, very fascinating. And as it turns out, really wildlife management is about fuels and fire management because that's of all the things that affect wildlife, definitely fire is, is a big deal. So let's talk about some of the species. <clears throat> Nick mentioned a condor. Here's one of our birds, uh, number 19, flying around. It's a gorgeous, huge bird. I mean, you know, it's all uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder, right? So whoops. Um, <laughs> But it is fascinating that that species has recovered a great deal. When I got here, we pulled in the last of the condors. I think there were 20 or so left. We captured the last one in the late 1980s. Um, we started the condor recovery program. And uh, there's almost 400 now in the wild. So it, it is uh, a, a good thing they are recovering. Uh, one of these species, I think it might have been this bird, was captured, uh, I think, in 1988 when I first got here. And it was 30 years later. It was used for the breeding program. It was released back into the wild. And last spring, I was hiking out there in the upper Sisquoc, and there, there he was flying around. He went right back to the same rocks he used to hang on 30 years ago, flew right back there. So, and he's, and he's actively breeding in, in the wild now. <coughs> it's a good program. Uh, steelhead. We really have some nice steelhead populations. Uh, there's even steelhead down here uh, in, in Goleta, up and down these, these, some of these channels here. Um, the real big steelhead country is up in the Big Sur country. Little Sur River that comes through there. It looks like southern Oregon. There's 10-foot diameter <coughs> dug firs and redwoods in there, and it's just an amazing country. You know, steel had this big coming in and out every winter. So, uh, some really interesting country up there. Probably heard of the California red-legged frog. Uh, this is the species, whoops, I jumped. Uh, that is, uh, it, oh, of course, in our aquatic areas, our riparian areas, and um, there's a lot of contention about endangered species, whether they should be or not. Some people think, oh, it's a frog, you know, how can you put this above all the other interests? Well, we don't do that, um, but it is, again, the endangered species are, are species that we have to respond to. It's a part of the law. The Forest Service doesn't have that authority. Or it's not within our, our, our uh, decision space to list or delist. That's, we have to deal with this one. 
my role as a biologist was to make sure that we could, we could continue our projects, we could continue doing things, uh, but be sensitive to, these, to the impact of these species. California spotted owl, <coughs> another uh, species that's uh, sensitive to uh, old growth forest, which we do have here. <coughs> We've lost some of our old growth forest. <coughs> Excuse me. For instance, on Big Pine Mountain after the Zaka fire, we had a very intense, high, high intensity fire burn over the top of Big Pine Mountain. Some of the oldest, uh, nicest old growth we had, huge trees, uh, one of those fire dependent ecosystems with uh, usually had high frequency, low intensity burns that kept it open woods and grass. Burned through all of that and really there's almost zero regen up there and it's all Ceanothus right now. So very, very different. We're seeing changes like that occur throughout the forest. <coughs> Not all species are glamorous or are seen. This is a fairy shrimp, a teensy little thing like this. It's a longhorn fairy shrimp. Or cons yeah, that's a longhorn. Um, but endangered species come in all, all classes and, and, and shapes and sizes. Um, these occur in these vernal pools, these wet areas. It's, these are natural sinks that are out there that fill up in the wintertime. Uh, uh, fascinating history in these things. Uh, well, briefly, they, they have these cysts. They're like eggs. They can last for uh, hundreds, at least maybe thousands of years in soil. Uh, they can be picked up by winds. They, uh, these, <laughs> these little cysts, these eggs, have blown across the Mediterranean from Africa to, to uh, Europe. And um, they're so hardy that they, in one, one case they took these cysts and they brought them up in the space lab and they put them on a piece of duct tape and stuck them out there in, in outer space for a week. They brought them back in and they hatched them, right? So that, that leads to all these conspiracy, well, not conspiracy, these theories, right? These could be interstellar travelers. Anyway, it's a, it really goes on and on. Um, so interesting species. Here's another one, the red bat. Uh, we, have, we have 17 species of bats on the forest. Not all of them are listed, but uh, very interesting. Some of these things are, uh, they live 30 years. Uh, they migrate from, from Canada to, to Mexico and back. Um, some of them fly 50 to 100 miles a night. They'll, they'll take off, not this one, this is in our riparian areas, but some of them will take off and go 20,000 feet and feet on moss all night and come back. Just uh, another fascinating uh, species group. And of course we have plants too. This is the Kamada Canyon of Mole. It grows up uh, on San, San Luis County um, by Red Hill Road. It grows on a very old soil type. But again, we do have plants that are listed. <clears throat> so lots to deal with. Uh, and then, of course, our firefighters often find different species <laughs> out here, too. So <laughs> this, <clears throat> all, all uh, humor aside, uh, our firefighters have been excellent to work with. Uh, we do have a really good relationship with our firefighters. Nick was one of the, you know, exemplary. Um, worked with us, really interested in, in species conservation and what the Forest Service does. The Forest Service firefighters, I find, are uh, interested and very sensitive to this because, whoops, I think I'm squeezing this thing. Oh, wrong way. Okay, let me get us back. That really jumped. Okay. Um, yeah, so the Forest Service firefighters are very sensitive to what we're trying to do, and we're, we're a land management agency. So it's a little bit different, for instance, from um, Cal Fire, who's excellent firefighters. They work, work with them really well, but they have different perspectives. They don't uh, manage the land for that long term. So we're looking at a fire. We come off of a fire. And we're dealing with the consequences of our fire suppression and uh, the, the post-fire effects for decades to come, uh, both on the ground and legally and all kinds of things. So we, we have this very long-term perspective in the Forest Service about the effects of fire and fire management. Okay, so some of the things we talked about, other things that affect wildlife that I work with, some of the other uh, disciplines in the forest, we include off-highway vehicles and the effects uh, uh, on wildlife, um, hiking trails, which uh, often have very little effect to, uh, obviously this is the Big Sur country, um, but hiking trails also can, can bring in uh, invasive species that can be you know, transported through our trail systems. So we, we do a lot of work in, in all the different disciplines. We work with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They manage the game, they manage the hunts, they manage all the species access and, and um, you know, uh, all those hunting seasons. We manage the land and we work with them a lot. So we've had different programs to study deer populations and, and do censuses with them. Grazing is a big um, uh, aspect of what we do in the National Forest. Lots of grazing out here, lots of, of country with grasslands and, and uh, savannas that we have, I think, 97 different allotments. So it was a really big program. Road maintenance, of course, that has a lot of effects on wildlife. Um, just going through our riparian areas and trying to keep our roads open. Of course, we're trying to do the work in the springtime when the rain's done, but that's when all the species are breeding. So we're trying to balance all those things out and <coughs> keep those roads open. 
lots of special use permits. Um, you know, the towers and the communication towers, the power lines, the gas lines, all those things. There's thousands of special use permits that we're trying to keep up with on the Los Padres National Forest. Very difficult to keep that, that uh, going. Uh, the budgets have been shrinking. We used to have like 80% of our people in non-fire work doing resource and, and uh, recreation and the trails and all those things. Um, budgets have shrunk, prices have gone up, but we, we maintain fire uh, safety, so the fire crews themselves uh, represent now, and the money that we spend in fire represent about 80% of the budget on the Los Padres. Um, it's good and bad, but uh, things are, are changing quite a bit. Okay, oil and gas development. We do have a small oil and gas uh, area down near uh, Fillmore. Um, and Hopper Mountain Refuge it's, uh, is in, also in that area. Um, ironically, that's the condo release site is right here uh, at the uh, oil and gas development area. Um, a lot of controversy there, some impacts to wildlife. Incidentally, uh, that's been there since the late 1800s, and there has been fracking in that area since the 1960s. Um, no really noticeable impacts from the fracking that we see, probably because it's, it's two miles deep, but um, in any case, it's, it's something we've worked on a lot uh, with wildlife. Okay, we, we deal with invasive species. This is uh, bay leaves with sudden oak death in the northern part of the forest. That's a big deal. We're losing a lot of species out there. So it's changing our ecosystems. We're losing the, the tan oaks and a lot of the other oaks. Um, it's one of those things that, that is changing our fire regimes even. It's creating a lot of dead fuels. Uh, it's, it's changing the species mix. So um, invasive species, especially with climate change and all the, the impacts from people coming in, is a big deal. It's, it's changing our landscape wildlife. And of course fuels management, um, I believe that's uh, West Camino out there, but uh, you can see the fuel break going through here. So fuels management is, uh, is a really important aspect of wildlife management. You know there's impacts to doing a fuel break like this that are short term. And right there obviously um, you know that is different than this. The species mix in there will be different. We shouldn't say it's not going to be, but that's the intent. And so, uh, you know, uh, but if you, if you look at the, the alternative, and if you believe that, that these make a difference with the larger landscape when it burns, that's really what's going to cause this problem. The, the amount of species that are lost or changed from this versus large wildfires, like the Thomas fire, <coughs> are, are minuscule, right? So it's good to keep that in perspective. Oops, mind of its own. So what, what affects species and habitats the most? wildfire, especially these large wildfires. We've had the Zaka fire, we've had the Thomas fire up north, we've had the Sobranus fire, millions of acres, right? I mean, over the years, hundreds of thousands even at a time. And when these fires are very large and, and burn off most of the habitats and, and don't leave any islands uh, for, for re, re inhabitation <clears throat> the effects in wildlife are immense. I mean, that's looking down the top of Cold Canyon. Uh, you can see the Channel Islands. There's really no vegetation there. This is, these are huge impacts to wildlife. All the other things combined that the Forest Service does in terms of uh, management uh, pale in comparison to the effects of wildlife from these fires. So if you turn around and look the other way, I mean, you can look all the way to Santa Paula, all right, as far as you can see, and there, there was nothing back after the uh, Thomas fire. Um, it takes a long time for habitats to recover. And that's one of the aspects of fire that I'm most concerned about as a biologist and, and the potential extinctions, local extinctions, because of these very large fires that burn whole watersheds at a time. <clears throat> okay, I'll read through this, uh, keep it as short as I can. Fire affects uh, wildlife and habitats in the Los Padres more than any other management action. The habitats will most likely recover as they always have. These species uh, are adapted to fire. But the acreage of the impact is immense compared to most management actions. The, the, uh, the fires that burn, like the Thomas fire was 300 almost, I think, and the um, Zaka fire was, I forget now, two something. But these are huge fires that burn entire watersheds. We need to have large scale perspective of these management impacts. Like I said, it's not just, um, if we can look at a fuel break and it seems like a big thing up there in the Camino Cielo, but relative to some of our wildfires, the effects on the wildlife is relatively pretty small. Fire is one of the main drivers of change to our management options. I mean, when we look at our, our, all the things that I talked about, recreation and fuels and grazing and all those things, fire affects all those things too. Um, and it affects our fuels project. For instance, we had fuel projects like uh, the Tepescay burn, um, and then the Zaka fire came. You know, what's the point of doing this controlled, uh, this, this prescribed burn uh, right after the whole area around it just burned off? So, 
fire changes, just resets the perspective of the Forest Service continuously. I mean, we just kind of stop and go, okay, start over. You know, what's our plan of work now? It completely changes after these big fires. So it's, it's, it's a constant reset. And of course, things like public asset access and backcountry use change too. We need to use current peer-reviewed science to understand the outcomes and the options. Um, and science informs our balance of values, but doesn't dictate our choice. What I'm saying here is that um, this, this is really important as a biologist because uh, as a biologist, everybody when you first get there is, is kind of suspicious. Are you are you using your job as an, a, a, to, to drive your agenda for in the environment? Or are you using it from the environmental perspective to just simply support a project that the Forest Service wants? You have to overcome that by building up your trust with people. It takes a long time, uh, a lot of empathy and listening and trying to understand where they're coming from. But using good science, which is the policy of the Forest Service, is really important um, so that we all have something we can agree upon as our information to move forward on. But just because we know that uh, if you do a controlled burn, uh, these particular species will decrease it doesn't mean that makes your decision for you. That's just the value you're using. You just need that information to balance those values for community protection versus, versus uh, wildlife protection, for instance. So uh, as, a, as a biologist, building trust was a core piece of my job for the whole career. Uh, it, was, it was super important to maintain the trust with uh, not only within the Forest Service, but with our cooperators. And, uh, and, and once you've got that trust, then they start to open their doors and listen to what you have to say also. Something that, that I didn't know when I first got there, and I thought, you know, my role is to, my role is to make sure certain things happen in the Forest Service, and that's just not it at all. Um, that, that is not what we do. And, and it is important to know, too, that um, as a biologist, my, my feeling was I was there to support what the forest needed to do. They've got a mission, and part of that mission would, would be fuels management, for instance, and uh, my role was not to stop that. It was to try to make it happen while maintaining, you know, our legal um, uh, requirements under the ESA and other uh, laws. Okay, fire impacts to species differ depending on the frequency and scale of burns. I mentioned this, high frequency fire may change species mix, uh, and, and introduce noxious plants. Uh, some of our habitats, like some of our, uh, our uh, chaparral habitats, potentially are burning too frequently. You see that in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, Santa Clara River area, we have wind events and we see we have lots of human starts. Um, we're seeing fire come through over and over too frequently probably. We're seeing changes in vegetation types moving to grassland communities, lots of noxious weeds coming in. But not all habitats are like that. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the higher elevation forest were more attuned to lightning strikes coming and starting fires in more like a five to ten year period. And in that case, is fire suppression has allowed for fuel buildup. And uh, if we get a fire in there, it may be taking out these larger, these larger trees in, in this habitat. So we've got, you know, uh, there's no one formula. You have to look at certain areas in different habitats uh, and how fire affects that. Also, the large scale fires affect the watershed quality more than the frequent smaller fires. This is something that I've, I've been worried about over the years um, in terms of fire management and, uh, and fire effects. It seems to me, and maybe Max, you know this, uh, but you know, it seems to me that Overall, there's, there are, are larger percentages of large fires. I don't know if that's true or not, but and these large fires, like the Thomas Fire and the Zaka Fire, they worry me because they take out entire watersheds. And not only is that bad for our community water systems, right, like Jameson and Gibraltar filling up with sediment, that's an issue. But for the same reason, it's um, affecting our, particularly our riparian and, and aquatic species, like steelhead, red-legged frog, and all those species that use that, that riparian area. Those places fill in with sediment right up to the top. I mean, after the Zaka fire, the Sisquoc River was completely filled. All the, the pools were 10, 20 feet deep, filled to the very brim with, with silt. Just a fine layer of water going over the top of those. And then we had a, a drought that went for years and years. And so we had this basically blocked out breeding in this entire river system for uh, you know seven, eight years. Uh, this combined with the fact that there's not good habitat, there's not good uh, connection to habitat because of human development. I mean, we use water, we divert water, and uh, these species only exist in a few places. They have a really hard time re recovering from this kind of event. Um, it would be much better to see a fire be introduced into the backcountry and have, have a diversity of age classes back there. Because we've all seen as firefighters, I think, 
Nick, you've seen it. Rob, you've seen it. When, it, when a fire comes through and it burns up against another fire that's, that's uh, not even that old or it's actually fairly old, <coughs> we definitely see a change in fire behavior. And we saw the Ray Fire stop up against the Zaka Fire and the Thomas Fire stop up against the Ray Fire. And we've even, I've even seen fires that um, just suddenly kind of slowed down and almost almost went out and what was going on, we look at a map and sure enough there's a 20 year old burn there, you really couldn't even notice from a distance the difference in vegetative uh, fuels content. Um, now wind driven fires can push through anything but, but not all wind driven fires stay as a wind driven fire um, and eventually you know we, we are looking at uh, trying to find a place to stop those fires. I think that we, it's important to introduce fire into the backcountry for this ecological reasons. Uh, if you say we're uh, bringing fire into the backcountry to protect communities, I just don't think that that's a really good sell. Uh, they'll find their way around it. I think that's a different animal, something we should talk about differently. The fuel breaks around town, you know, hardening and uh, safety zones and uh, developing fire, fireproof environments around our homes. Those are all really important things to do. But I still think there's a really good point of having uh, fuels management in the backcountry. Okay. So obviously wildlife management is inseparable from fire and fuels management. That's kind of how and why I got into being uh, into fire so much. So here's me uh, uh, way back on the Zaka fire. You can see the Zaka fire on the map there. Uh, working as a resource advisor, and as Nick said, <coughs> we, this is when we involve ourselves in fire suppression itself during the fire event. And what we're trying to do is uh, minimize the impact of fire suppression techniques to these sensitive areas when safety allows it, okay? We don't stop anything for an endangered species. Uh, if, it's, if safety is concerned, if people's lives are concerned, never have, never will. Fish and Wildlife Service is on board with this one, and we don't even want to go down that path of uh, you know, putting people at risk for this endangered species. We'll deal with it later, right? But when there's time, um, for instance, during contingency planning, when we're looking out, we're sitting down with the planning department, uh, planning section chief and we're saying in, in a week we want to get the lines built out here and out here we've got some choices we've got some time we can go around uh, riparian areas we can go around some archaeological sites those are the kind of things we do as a resource advisor <coughs> as I said riparian areas are particularly sensitive and we'll walk over those we track fire returns as you can see uh, the FOS check and other formulas uh, way back when had uh, an anti-rust component, a yellow phosphate of sodium, something like that. <coughs> Obviously, you don't want the, the tanks rusting out on your tankers. Um, but that formulation had the unfortunate consequence of when it got in water and sunlight got on it, it made cyanide. So very toxic. It killed trout. It killed everything in the water. So really, really a bad thing. Um, and uh, we went through a big lawsuit, ended up tracking, tracking retardant. And uh, we still are tracking return where it goes. But the formulations now are extremely, um, they're just, just almost non-toxic, especially compared to what was there before. So, uh, of course, if you just dump a huge load from a 747, it fills in the channel, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect things. It's going to take, take out some, some trout or whatever is in there. But uh, the formulations themselves are really non-toxic. Okay, then we work on a fire uh, suppression repair plan. Suppression repair would be like dozer lines. And we're going in there and trying to get to stop the, the erosion from taking place, you know, doing erosion control work. Uh, we're not bringing it all the way back to full, you know, repair of what it was like before. Yeah, but we're, we're going in making the plan so that when it rains, it's just not flushing and making these giant gullies done. Those ones. Okay, so what about the post-fire effects? When that fire is over, now we're looking at this. This is the kind of thing that happened. Uh, this is uh, San Ysidro Canyon, and uh, you know, on top of the tragedy that would happen for, in Montecito, uh, we have this, this impact to species, okay? Uh, you can see Patrick Leesky, these forest biologists now, look at the size of these boulders. That doesn't look like steelhead habitat to me, right? This is pretty, this is pretty heavily affected. It's going to be a long time before we get some wildlife habitat back there. And this happened across the forest, uh, miles and miles and miles of streams. Um, and we had some, some debris flows that were even, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than this, like an upper, upper Matillahawk Canyon. Um, we had 30-foot boulders, one after another for a mile-long stretch back there. It's amazing what happened. Um, it, it's just so much larger than what happened in Montecito. This is a, a, these things happen in areas that, uh, where we didn't have homes or people, so it was okay. We didn't, most people didn't, don't even know about that. 
but it has a huge effect on our wildlife resources, of course. <coughs> so we have our bear teams. Uh, burned Area Emergency Response. Probably a lot of you have heard about that one. Uh, this program is to identify imminent post-wildfire threats to human life and safety, property, and critical natural cultural resources on federal land, and uh, it's taken immediate actions to manage this unacceptable risk. Uh, that's, that's what the bear team does. So let me just break that down a little bit. Um, obviously, after the fire, you've lost your vegetation. Vegetation and the soil, of course, is heated up. It's, it's burned off those, those uh, protective uh, elements of the soil. And then it rains, you can see this gulling. This is at the top of uh, Cold Springs Canyon right after the rain uh, on 1-9. This is February. That leads to sedimentation, all that erosion, all that soil coming down, leads to sedimentation, which is, is the uh, carrying of all the sediment down into these channels and into our reservoirs, like this is Jameson. You can see it's just filled with, uh, with all this, this gook. And uh, you know, it's, it's highly high in nutrients, so you get this algae blooms in here. Um, I don't know what the status is now, but it, that's the water supply, obviously, for Montecito. So it makes a big difference here. Um, Flooding, of course, you get that water runoff because it's coming off the soil really quickly and just pouring down, out across the landscape and uh, you can cause flooding problems. Uh, rock fall just from rock being loosened up. You know, the vegetation holds a lot of the rock in place out there. And it, when that's gone, firefighters know this, that rock immediately is starting to fall down. Not only the small, small grains that we call dry gravel, but the larger boulders too are coming down. And of course, debris flows, the most dangerous of all these. Uh, debris flow, of course, is happens when, like on the Thomas fire, all that dry gravel mixes up in that steep country. And uh, that's the prime ingredient for this uh, debris flow, which floats large boulders. So it rains really, really hard, like we saw on 1-9, uh, uh, you know, starting at about a half inch per hour. It's all about the rainfall rates, not about the total for the season. It's about that storm itself. At about a half inch per hour, you'll see these debris flows starting in the top. Uh, you know, you get up towards an inch, inch and a half, those debris flows will carry down farther and farther. So the bigger the storm, the farther the, the debris flow will go. Well, this particular storm um, brought us, uh, for a five minute period, it brought us six inches per hour. So it's extreme, I mean, you can hardly, I mean, that is, I've never been in that myself. It, two inches per hour, you, you can't even see through your windshield wipers, right? It's just going hard as you can, you have to pull over. Six inches per hour, I mean, it's like taking a bucket of water and just chucking it onto a sand pile. It's just gonna move a lot of sediment. Real suddenly, it's just gonna wash it all down. It mixes in with that fine material, and it creates this really cement-like mix that's um, super dense. And because it's so dense, it, it floats boulders up, and it starts moving those down. Those grind bigger and bigger boulders as you go down. It takes out the vegetation, and uh, of course, is very destructive. <coughs> Extremely powerful, and uh, has a huge amount of inertia, as we saw. So the bear teams are consist of biologists, and but uh, they, they do another role. But that's how I got started but hydrologists and geologists, and we're trying to understand the probability of these kinds of events after fires. So I worked on the Thomas fire here. Um, as I said, I worked with Rob Lewin. He invited us in. Fortunately, we had worked together on the Sherpa fire and the Whittier fire and the Ray fire, and uh, we were very comfortable working here. We were staying in that JIC office over there, and um, we knew all the players. We knew who should be involved, and we all knew what our roles were. This was really important to, to hit the ground running because when the Thomas fire quit burning, we had just a matter of days. As a matter of fact, as soon as we got everybody together, you have to wait till, till the fire's over to know what you're dealing with, right? If, you, if you're looking at a watershed and only half of it's burned and you do your analysis, well, the next day, the other half burned, you gotta redo everything. So you have to kind of wait till things are done. As soon as the fire was over, we got together and the weather forecast was saying, you know what? big change looks like a little water, water's coming out our way a little rain's coming our way and uh, sure enough we, we were scrambling and it was a good thing that we knew each other we knew what was going on um, and we we had a lot of experience in this in, in this area so uh, it was crucial uh, I can't imagine what would have happened if we didn't have that kind of setup already okay um, we do something it's called a soil burn severity map is what we we create if you read this uh, we establish the watershed response. We determine the threats to the values at risk. Values at risk are like our homes and, and bridges and whatever we have. The threats come from the watershed above it. Uh, oftentimes in cases like this, the threats are up there on Forest Service lands. 
but the values at risk are down here in private lands and, and state and, and uh, cities. So obviously a lot of cooperation has to take place, which, which we did between the Forest Service and the other agencies. We can propose treatments. Forest Service can propose the treatments on us. Other people can propose the treatments. Uh, the cost has to be dealt work with, um, you know, who pays for what. And then we have seven days to uh, start and finish our bear report. So it's a very short window of time, as I said. Um, that's because we often have a short window of time before these events can, can take place. We look at the soil burn severity. These are different examples of how hot it burns. The amount of heat that's imparted into the soil burns through the soil and makes it more friable, makes it more erodible. Uh, the soil has this uh, really intense um, um, mycorrhizae and cyanobacteria and all these uh, fungus and mosses and lichens and all the other creatures that live there hold this, this living soil together. When that's burned, uh, it becomes very fragile and it takes a while, it takes years for that to come back. But <clears throat> So one of the good measures of how erosive a site is, is how much fuel had burned and how hot the soil was. That's our soil burn spray now. Here's the soil burn severity map. Actually, this is the debris flow hazard map based on soil burn severity. We use satellite information. We pull down uh, information from uh, pictures that were taken by satellite just before the fire that have been archived. We compare them with post-fire uh, imagery from the satellites, and we determine how much heat has been imparted based on how much burning took place. From that, USGS comes up with our uh, debris flow maps. You can see the red all over the place in here is high probability of a debris flow with about an inch per hour, 28 millimeters per hour. That's, that's the kind of rainfall that really start these things. <clears throat> we have potential debris flow, uh, rock fall and rock slides. As you can see, uh, they're all different. Uh, the debris flow is the most dangerous one that flows down those channels. I described that process to you. We saw it coming down uh, Cold Springs and San Ysidro and, and all the other channels here. Uh, Landslides are a little differently, uh, different, work in a different way. For instance, the landslide at Carpinteria uh, is, um, not Carpinteria, um, along the coast there, as we saw that big landslide take place um, in that area. That has to do with saturation of the soil, deep, deep saturation of the soils. That has to do with the long-term seasonal rain that, that, that saturates that soil really deeply. It's unstable and then it slips down. Uh, that's a different kind of event. Those are not changed, the probability of those has not changed too much by fire. Um, mostly it's the rainfall intensity that causes these debris flows. <coughs> okay, so we get flooding sedimentation. Uh, we had evidence of past debris flows, so we knew that they were susceptible in these areas. A lot of what we're looking at is based on models of what, how this landfall, uh, land forms will respond to, to uh, fires and then, and then post-fire rainfall. So, it's really difficult to predict because you've got an a, a uncertainty level of your forecast. You don't know exactly how much rain is going to fall, where it's going to fall exactly, and what the intensities are. You've also got uncertainty how the, the watersheds will respond. But in this case, we had historical uh, records of debris flow and flooding in the Thomas Fire area. So we knew it was quite probable. We assess our roads. Obviously, roads are going to take a lot of damage from, from erosion after these kind of events. And we end up spending, at least in the Forest Service, um, it, millions of dollars trying to repair the roads afterwards. Trails, of course. This is the trail. The dry gravel came over. You, this is the old trail bed right here. You can see that it's just filled in. Uh, in a way, that's good. It'll, it will stand a lot of rainfall and, and erosion that takes place. And uh, when, once things grow back and the soil stabilizes, you can go and dig it back out. In the meantime, you have to leave it like this. But the hiking trails around here are obviously um, highly valued by the public, and people use those all the time. Here's Patrick walking ahead of me. The trail's in there somewhere. <laughs> it's pretty filled in. And of course, invasive plant species. This is yellow star thistle. That's, uh, you know, it comes in in these areas that have burned over. It's highly susceptible. It's, it's a ripe uh, place for, for all these endangered, uh, invasive species to come in. Uh, and they can be a real problem. They can have a huge economic impact on, on grazing and, and agriculture and uh, recreation and all kinds of things. So one, of, one of the things, especially with climate change, we're worried about on the National Forest. Um, a fisheries assessment. Obviously, um, fisheries take a big hit because of the sedimentation that comes in afterwards, <coughs> and the risk is, is pretty high. This is El Capitan Creek. Um, you can see it afterwards. It's changed quite a bit, lost a lot of vegetation. El Capitan, you re might remember on the Sherpa Fire, 
flooded severely in January, I think it was 16 or 17 maybe. So that was a case too where um, we necessarily have to make our predictions and our uh, for, for evacuations conservative for safety, right? You have to say if it's gonna rain this much, then you know, once, once it hits this level, we need you to evacuate, we need to move out of these areas. Um, oftentimes it doesn't pan out that that was really an event that took place. And this is what happened in, uh, on the Sherpa fire in El Capitan Canyon. <clears throat> we had five or six rain events. They all triggered uh, warnings for the folks there at El Capitan at the, at the, the campground at the bottom, uh, but nothing really happened. So as we all do, we say, you know, here comes this next rain event. Yeah, we've been through this five or six times. Doesn't look like it's gonna happen. But guess what? The other rain events didn't rain as much as they thought, and this one rained more, and now, we had this huge debris flow in the upper canyon there of El Capitan. Sure enough, it came down in a giant debris flow. It tore out all the vegetation. Most of the big boulders had dropped out, but the vegetation uh, floated down, the, down on the surface waters, made it all the way down to El Capitan, and uh, plugged up against those bridges. And the, 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 the power of the water was just immense, and it just bent those huge steel beams and popped them. Went from one bridge to the next, and then went down to the uh, uh, it's the culverts underneath the highway. They're like 10 foot culverts and, and kind of plugged up. Fortunately, because swirling around in this pool or in, in front of the highway were, were a couple cabins and there was a person in there and their cars floating around. And miraculously, everybody got out of the way. But when that plug blew out, it just sucked those cars and those cabins right on through that tunnel. There's just nothing left of them. Uh, fortunately, nothing was hurt. Nobody was hurt there, but um, it showed us the power uh, of that potential situation. And that was important to understand on the Thomas fire, too. Kevin, there's some water here for you if you want. To. Thank you. Is that mine right there? Yeah. yeah. Appreciate that. Um. <clears throat> All right. So some of the wildlife species, California condor, we've got uh, red-legged frog, right toad, and least bills virio. Some of the things that we worry about afterwards. Um. Okay. Move forward. Look. Cultural resources. I'm just going to skip through some of that. We we took a look. We take a look at those two, and we're worried about those and, and try to protect those after fires. All right. So one of the things I did for the city of Montecito was try to look at the vegetation recovery because the probability of all these bad things happening, these debris flows, is related to how stable that soil is. It's the vegetation regrowth that affects that stability, right? So we need. To, it's really important to track the vegetative regrowth afterwards, <clears throat> so we can know what the, the you know the effects are after that first year. Um, we had very little vegetation there. Unfortunately, even though it was a, a drought year, uh, we had that really high intensity mm -hmm. rainstorm, but that drought didn't allow the vegetation to come back. So we, that second year um, of rainfall after the Thomas fire was still really dangerous. And that was really important to know. Um, so you know about evacuations and, and, and areas to worry about, right? So we need to know what that probability is. <coughs> This is Yanni Schwartz, uh, obviously uh, walking through a huge area that's been wiped out in Sandy Cedar Canyon. This boulder, I think, uh, I, I stood up next to it, about my head would be right, right there. Very large, very amount, huge amounts of debris would come through. Okay, so this is late January. That's me walking down the slope. Hardly any regrowth coming in. Uh, we had a hot fire and lots of soil loss and late rains. We were thought we thought maybe this uh, fire wouldn't recover just because we lost so much soil that, that the seeds and sources would have gone down with it. But fortunately, that wasn't the case. As I talked about before, we use satellite imagery. It's uh, it's um, the sa the satellite imagery is archived, so we can go back and get pre-fire work. And we come up with a soil burn severity map. The yellow is what's called moderate, um, which might surprise you if, if you went out there afterwards. That that you'd say was that moderate because there's just nothing left but some stops and some, some rock out there. But uh, remember, it has to do with the amount of heat that's been imparted to the soil. And even in the moderate uh, burn areas, it's still extremely erosive and extremely dangerous. The high intensity burns is when you have large trees, you know, large diamond trees that cook and burn for hours and hours and really, really heat up that soil. Fortunately, we don't have that. It's still bad enough, obviously. OK, so we went back. Uh, and, and redid the satellite imagery to try to see how things were changing um, in uh, the first summer, and it really hadn't grown back much at all. We had maybe 20, 40 percent cover. It wasn't looking very good after that first year. We didn't normally we get much better growth than that. It all had to do with the amount of rainfall we got. <clears throat> we had all this information about uh, 
what happened in the past uh, that the city of Montecito put together. You know, here's the rainfall, uh, the date, the forecast, what kind of rain we thought was going to happen, uh, the risk level, and then here's how much we actually got. Okay, so they uh, forecasted a half to 1.25, and uh, they got about a half. They did pretty good here, a little bit lower than they thought. And then here's what happened. So we got some some debris came down, but we had to clean it out. Now all this information is really important because this is really this is the real test of what's going to happen. Um, so gathering this information after fires is crucial to understanding what's going to happen next time. As I said, otherwise we just have these models to rely on, and they have a lot of variability in them. Um, so uh, this this is what's called ex uh, experimental, or this is real life examples of what we need to develop our models to understand what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so we uh, went last year and uh, this past summer and took a look at the vegetation and uh, you know, trying to figure out what the hazards would be this year. And we saw quite a bit of vegetation regrowth. The satellite imagery showed you know, uh, 60 percent plus all green through this area. That's great, but uh, still that's kind of a broad range, 60 to 100 percent. The probability of debris flows really starts to drop off at about 60 percent, but um, it's not all the way gone. So we went out and got a little bit more information. Okay, some I used some UAV footage here. Let's see if I can get that to go. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Yeah. There you go. Okay. <coughs> Just briefly, I know we're starting to run out of time here, but um, these are the, the canyons burned. This is right after. You can see that rilling that took place here. I had these certain scenes that I flew over and over and compared. Uh, this is Upper Cold Springs. This is uh, one year after the previous photograph uh, or video that took place. You can see the vegetation coming back here. <clears throat> this is April, even a little bit later. We saw some uh, really good growth this year. We had an excellent rainfall last year, and we had just obviously that was the missing ingredient for vegetation recovery. This is in the, in the fall, and it's even better. A lot of the vegetation has dried out. But uh, we were looking then at about 60 to 80 percent cover plus in this area. So um, here we are, moved on to another scene again through this, going through the same sequence. You can see all that soil loss and rilling. Um, <coughs> this is a year later, and it's it's better, but we didn't get much growth. That was not a great fire year or uh, growth year. Last last winter, a year ago, we had some really good rains, and things really responded well. Fortunately. It put us back um, to really, really reduce the risk of debris flows. We'll see what happens this year. I think the Thomas fire is still in pretty good shape. That vegetation is not going to go away. I don't think the, the hazard is going to get much worse. Um, unless, perchance, we had a windstorm and we had a fire that would burn through that vegetation. It is susceptible to burning again. It's a lot of fine vegetation. Uh, that, would be, that would really be trouble. <coughs> Again, this is the middle San Ysidro Creek. Here it is in August, just this last August. Very well grown back. Um, we did some, some aerial photography above there too. So I'm going to skip forward on this one uh, and uh, in the interest of time, we can take a look at some of the vegetation. This is uh, comparing Google Earth imagery from uh, before the fire uh, on the left to videography left on the right of just after the fire. So the reason I'm doing this is I can use Google Earth and uh, angle it and, and follow myself, uh, follow this video on the right, and see what how far it's got to go to get back to the original condition pre-fire where we knew what the risk was. It was quite low of debris flows. So you can see some of the same, see the reeling that took place over here down to bedrock and over here the matching place. Obviously, that's going to be a wild support response. But uh, this is kind of a comparative uh, work that we did to try to understand what was happening. We also obviously got out on the ground and took a look at some of the areas. There it is one year later, and here it is this, this summer. That's bush poppy growing up right there. There's the chemise in the background, and, and all tangled on through here was uh, Casalidia, the, uh, the uh, morning glory, commonly grows after fire, so very, very thick. Uh, let's go through one more plot. These are the um, our Eric Nasita, our soil scientist, looking at right after the fire and flooding a year later. And then here we are. If Eric was in there, you couldn't see him. That's 
that stuff was five or six feet high this summer. So really need that rainfall uh, to recover the, the vegetation here. And, and we took some aerial photography photographs also from a drone. Good cover on there. Um, and you can see, although underneath there's, there is some bare soil that's, that's uh, showing up in here. So that's, that's of some concern. The soil hasn't recovered all those mycorrhizal uh, connections and all that uh, vegetation um, cover and all the fine, you know, like I said, cyanobacteria and things that, that help that soil recover and absorb soil, uh, moisture. This was interesting. There's this one little spot that didn't burn in Upper Cold Springs. Uh, and so we crawled in there right after the flooding took place in 1-9, and we took a look at this and, and said, what happened to the soil underneath this vegetation that didn't burn? And so if you remember all the pictures of the rilling, here's the same kind of slope, same right next to the place where it was burned and had all that, everything that took place. We dug a little pit there, took some measurements, and you can see almost none of that soil moved at all. So uh, this was right after that flooding took place. So this is, this is the protective power of the vegetation and, and healthy soil. That's really important to understand that that is an immense amount of protection there. Okay, um, again, what we're seeing, I'll just uh, jump to the conclusion here. Uh, we have about 80 to 90 percent canopy cover, and it's not as ro robust as pre-fire, but the soil re is recovering, not quite to pre-fire conditions, but we're very much out of the woods compared to the same risk we had before, uh, before the vegetation grew back on, on the Thomas fire. Now we got, uh, <clears throat> before I go into this, we also had the, uh, the K fire that happened recently and it burned very similar. It burned very hot, very steep canyons, very, very susceptible to debris flows. Um, and that hasn't been tested really yet. I haven't seen any really hard rains on that one. And I, I don't think it's recovered enough. I, I think that's still a high risk area uh, that, um, you know, I don't know what's underneath that exactly and how far down that things are gonna go. But if you had the same kind of storm, it hit the K fire that we saw on the, um, on the Thomas fire above Montecito, I think you'd see something very large come out of that same, because it's very, very similar conditions. Uh, same kind of topography, soils, vegetation loss, all of that. So um, there is some recovery going on. It's, it's not enough to really protect uh, that K fire area yet. So we'll see what happens in March. Sometimes we get good rain. Lesson learned on the Thomas fire. Um, all parties involved have to play their role, and including the public. Um, the public has to understand that government agencies can't just swoop in and save them at the last minute, all right? They, they have to take a role, and we have to teach them that. They have to understand that. And many people had done that, but unfortunately, some didn't and uh, didn't realize what kind of um, hazards they were in without taking their own actions. We have to build relationships with the cooperators beforehand. I mean, I think that was crucial to all of us understand our roles and who we are and uh, how we're going to how we're going to deal with things. I know. The incident command system works really well that way. Um, so I need to understand the agency's roles. Uh, good public affairs officers involved with the press. That's super important to keep that information flowing back and forth so there's not uh, the wrong story going out. Um, the public needs to know what a debris flow is. I, I think they didn't know what a debris flow is, really. They thought maybe it was just a flood. You can go outside and kind of watch the water rising up slowly, and that wasn't the case. Um, we need to follow through with uh, two to five years of monitoring. Uh, the main role of the Forest Service is to provide scientific information to other agencies about what uh, the threats and risks are. You know, even on the K fire, what burned on the Forest Service lands was steep, but there's really nothing up there. I mean, so what if it has erosion and it, you know, things happen? There's, they're really, it's going to recover eventually and it's going to cause some damage, but um, you know, you got to ask the so what factor. The so what factor, though, is really what's happening below on other, other lands. So you, you put this, this, this kind of false line, uh, you know, we own this part, but somebody else owns it, so we're not going to touch it. Well, we know that's, that's not our role. Our role is to provide good information to the, the cities and the counties to understand what these effects and what some of the risks are to them. So we work cooperatively with the, all the agencies. Uh, Forest Service has the expertise and fire response paradigm in place to get our bear teams out quickly. That just means that we've got firefighters uh, and our regular staff, like uh, folks over here in Fuels and, and Heidi, uh, that are ready to go on fires. They have red cards, they, they know what to do, and when they're on call, they can, they can just go out right away. A lot of agencies don't have that kind of flood response teams uh, set up to go that, out that quickly. So it's one of our values there. And uh, of course, all aspects of fire, especially post-fire effects, influence wildlife management. Um, that's just 
why I got so much into uh, the fire, fire realm itself as a biologist. Okay, all actions including conservation resources have consequences. Um, there was a little video, let's see if it'll play. Nope. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to open it up for conversation or questions. Um, I kind of had to fly through a lot of stuff there, but there's my contact information if you need to get hold of me. So, um, with that, I don't know if you want to take a break or you want to just open it up. If you have any questions for Kim? Yes. I do. Uh, after the bear report, um, there are management uh, strategies, I guess, although when it's a large fire, there's really not much you can do, right? I mean, people keep asking us and the supervisors, you know, why aren't you uh, putting grass seed or doing right. something? And, right. and So that's a great question. I mean, there's lots that we used to do. As a matter of fact, when I first started, we just went out and, and uh, we used to dump seed everywhere through helicopter buckets uh, back Way back, we used to have a giant air tankers and people would stand strapped in with a shovel and fling rye seed everywhere, right? So uh, it was a very simplistic notion that there's, there's nothing out there now, you've got to put seed out. Well, it turned out that that's not the case at all. It made things much worse. The seed is out there. Uh, the, the vegetation is out there. The, the root stalks are out there. And it will grow back on its own. And it's been doing this for thousands of years, and it's, that's where it's, what it's most adapted to. That is what you want to happen. You have to be patient because it's got to rain. But when you add seed mix to that, <clears throat> you're introducing noxious species, you're uh, outcompeting the native species, and it might look green, but um, it is not necessarily holding back the soil anyway. It's not really doing the job you want. For instance, on the Thomas fire, we could have put tons of seed out there. Guess what it would have done? It would have washed down yeah. with everything else. Well, that's often the case. Um, <clears throat> so we've refined that. and. Um, Unfortunately, there aren't large-scale things like that that we can do to treat. So we've learned a lot of lessons, but it's, it's hard to do nothing. You know, the, the people want something. You've got to do something. We're, we're under this hazard. Um, it's caused us to step back and take a look at, uh, you know, the larger picture of how we avoid these, these issues. And um, part of it is, is the fact that we have these, these fires and floods that occur in this, this long frequency. We forget. Our communities forget. The people who live there forget. The people who permit buildings forget, and um, it's just natural. I mean, there's pressures to build, and then we end up in these in these situations where you have homes in very hazardous places. Um, if it only happens every 30 or 40 years, it's really difficult to control that. I mean, Southern California is even worse. I worked on the Holy Fire in Riverside in Orange County, and it's amazing. The, I mean, there was a school <coughs> in in a debris flow down there, the old debris flow. It was just right smack in the middle. They had to close it for the winter. So, I mean, uh, we need to step back and look at those things. We need to talk about floods in the same breath that we talk about fires. And uh, we need to uh, get ready for those. And in the same way that we're talking about hardening our homes and developing these landscapes that don't burn, we need to, to work with our communities to understand where these floods are going to happen. And if you can leave a path for them, and some communities have actually done this, you just leave that open path for them and let Mother Nature have its, have its way when it's going to flood like that, um, it's a non-event. Uh, but that's a big decision, especially when there's homes already in these places. So, difficult to deal with. Yeah. Yes. Do you give presentations to like city building departments and people who are making those decisions? Because I have learned so much this morning. It seems like education and just information to people who are making decisions would sure. be critical. Yes, I would, I would do that. Uh, we did that some in the Forest Service. Uh, <clears throat> you have to have a receptive audience for, for these. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I met with a lot of resistance sometimes with the suggestion that, that these, uh, the, this planning take place. But as you said, education about, you know, what the risks are um, is immense. And I think that's a really good, uh, that's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I agree. Uh, yes, sir. So for areas in the urban chaparral interface, that haven't previously had fuels management in a space above them, like a 300 foot zone or whatever, is post fire, when if the fire has taken out almost everything, is it good to start the management immediately post fire? Or because that would be an opportunity to do so? Or do you want everything to grow there and not thin it or manage it until it's recovered for a while? So it's a good question because it brings in the idea that um, you need to let the, the soil recover 
to prevent this, this flooding and this erosion that, that is taking place here. But um, I do believe it offer, offers a, a, a chance to do this work <coughs> in an easier, easier settings as long as you're not uh, slowing down significantly or causing erosion, potential erosion problems um, from the rains that will come during that first couple of years there. But I think for, for a couple of reasons. One is that you, you've got the vegetation cleared for you in a way that you can get started. I think that's what you're referring to, the, the ease of doing the work. So uh, also <coughs> you've potentially got some funding that happens after a fire. And obviously the interest is there for to get some community help and get other people involved with it. Um, it's very obvious that, you know, something, this is the time to, to change things and, and, you know, it's it's in our face, it just happened, let's take care of it. So it's good to take advantage of that, I think. Mm -hmm. An example of that was um, Bishop Canyon community, uh, hate to see the fire burned everything off the uh, interface and, and within uh, quite a bit of that community, obviously, as, as many of us remember. That was in 2009 and 2014, so five years later. It had been pretty decent um, regrowth. I think uh, a lot of the Cenothus was about waist to shoulder high. It had been about you know, 15 feet tall <laughs> before the fire. So we went in, the county fire department went in and got a grant and did a big um, interface field treatment uh, within that, that um, regenerating vegetation that was five years old. And it, uh, the amount of effort required and number of acres completed um, was significant compared to what we were trying to do before the fire. We actually were putting in a small field treatment before the fire in that massive 10 to 15 foot chaparral. And it, you know, it was several years just to get a couple acres cleared. Um, just trying to deal with the amount of biomass from that super old growth chaparral. Um, whereas, you know, the, the, the Hayes Cedar fire was a tragedy and it had, a, and it had some serious repercussions on that community. Um, but uh, on the positive note, we were able to take advantage of the lighter fuels. But we waited about five years, just for that main reason that we didn't want to go in there until yeah. the soil was stabilized and we yeah. didn't have erosional concerns. Because a lot of people were worried about erosion. When we started doing the work, they were like, well, what about erosion? Erosion and, and noxious weeds, especially, are it's very susceptible. When you disturb the soil, it's, uh, even if it's been burned, it's susceptible, but then disturbing it on top of that is, uh, makes it much worse for these uh, invasive species that come in. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good plan. It depends on uh, you know, how long you want to wait, though. You've got to watch that right. because, of course, you can, uh, after the Hayes Cedar fire, I think it was, or the Gap fire, one of those, we had a really good rain year. It might even been El Nino, uh, which allowed for a lot of gentle rains, which is just what you want, right? So lots of gentle rains throughout the winter. Grows that vegetation back really well. Uh, but, you know, you can hardly walk through it afterwards. So. But, yeah, you want to catch it when it's not, you know, before it's 10, 15 feet high. It's just yeah. impossible to move and manage that much, that much fuel and, and deal with it. So. Heidi? Um, well, I have a question about the mulch. Um, and on your suggestion of monitoring for, like, to five years, so who would do that? And then how would that information get to the public? Uh, that's a great question because bear funding is for immediately after the fire, from the Forest Service perspective. After that, it dries up. And so for myself, I just, uh, with you and some other folks, just took that on myself to manage that and, and look at that. Because some years, the second and third year, were just as hazardous as that first year. But people had kind of, it was out of their mind. They are mo moving on to other things. <clears throat> And we lucked out, but um, as we saw on the Thomas fire uh, and the Whittier fire, we had debris flows afterwards. And so uh, you call it Duval Canyon <coughs> on Highway 154. Uh, there was a debris flow last year, about, about a year ago right now. Um, we had a high intensity storm uh, that had recovered pretty well, but no one was watching it. Sure enough, debris flow came, it tore out the vegetation and plugged the culvert and 154. So yeah, we need to, we need to for a lot of reasons, uh, monitor what's happening up to five years afterwards. Um, and who does it? Um, <clears throat> well, it really should be Forest Service, but also the, uh, we work with the communities, the county, uh, um, anybody who can help afford this, because we all have a role to play and all have a risk at stake here. Um, we're not out of the woods yet, even on the, on the Thomas fire. And if no one's looking at it, then no one will know what that risk is anymore. So it was one of the things that I did in my job was just, just do that. I just found, found time on my own to, to get out there and try to, to do that monitoring. Matter of fact, I'm doing some monitoring on the vegetation regrowth on the K fire right now. So 
Um, hopefully, there's a better. Uh, I've always uh, promoted forest service funding of this uh, because we're the land managers, but um, so far, there's no real specific dollars for it. So it's a, it's a problem. You know. Question. Hey, yes, sir. I just want to comment on that. Actually, uh, there's a, a a volunteer botanist program being sponsored, I believe, by Santa Barbara Botanical Gardens. I did see that with uh, community citizen mm -hmm. science teams right. that are uh, volunteering to go out and hike trails and identify invasive species and regrowth of the Thomas Fire, actually, yeah. in Santa Barbara Montecito right. Trails as well as Ojai area. So. That's that's excellent. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, that had it was kind of uh, someone with <clears throat> some foresight had thought of that, and that's that's really wonderful. Um, oftentimes, this is not happening. I mean, this is look at all of California. Uh, there's no specific set way to do this, and I think it needs to be organized. I see a lot of efforts, a uh, little bit uh, dis disjunct, that need to be pulled together. But but that's one of them. That's a good effort, and I think it's it's highly valuable. Um, but I I just like on the flood assessment. One of the things that I did as a coordinator would pull in everybody into one room. Uh, before, right after the Thomas fire, and said, "We all have to be on the same page, uh, or we're going to stumble over each other. We're not going to get things. We're going to miss things, right?" So I think the same thing needs to happen somehow with all these this, these efforts afterwards. It's a good effort, though. It's a really good idea. Yeah. Anything else? <clears throat> well, thanks for your attention, everyone. I really enjoyed myself, and uh, maybe I'll see you back here sometime uh, on a fire or for some <laughs> other. <laughs> 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 <laughs>